Welcome to the Ideas Hour with your hosts, David Cameron and Suzanne Zedike, exploring big ideas that matter. This series was originally broadcast on Teacher Hub Radio in 2021 and 2022. It is still available in their archive, as well as in this format. So excited about today's conversation. We're going to touch on so many things that I'm obsessed with, the ideas of class, of of change, of education, of what makes us the society that we are. We're going to look at the consequences of private boarding schools, especially when the boarding experiences start at an early age. But more importantly than that, we're going to look at what that means for the culture of the upper class in Britain and what's becoming increasingly, again, the ruling class in Britain. There's a huge amount of attention now being paid by authors to boarding school, not only the dangers it presents to the children who grow up within this system, but to our society as a whole, because such a large proportion of our most powerful politicians come to office with the impaired emotional capacities that are one of the legacies of boarding education. You might think these are edgy and uncomfortable ideas, but I love them. And it's exactly what the ideas are been set up to explore. And the person who's going to help us to do this today is London-based Simon Partridge, who's writing and speaking about exactly this issue. Simon describes himself as a writer and researcher influenced by attachment theory and by the adverse childhood experiences research. But importantly for today's program, he also carries personal experience as an early boarder. He's been working to show the ways in which the British class system is in itself integrally interwoven with the boarding school system. He believes that it creates a nexus of power that goes all the way back to the medieval period. And he sees the British upper class family and boarding school complex as a system that replaces human emotional relationships with power relationships. And that is indeed a big idea. So Simon, welcome to the Ideas Hour. There are so many books coming out about boarding school. So that makes your work very timely. It's a delight to have you here, Simon. Pleasure to be here, Susan. Okay, can we start by getting you to tell us more about that introduction that David and I have given you? What does it mean for boarding school to replace emotional relationships with power relationships? What do you mean by that? Well, maybe that's stating it rather starkly. I think what it means is what we, what we know as the um, stiff upper lip, which is the broad description of the um, British upper class culture, it doesn't value emotions very highly. So, um, in a sense, What's happening, I think, is that within the familial context, within the cultural context, emotions are played down. And um, even uh, in a way sort of rather rather sidelined and, and, and not taken seriously. And boarding school continues and embeds that process. So maybe the word replace is a bit strong. But what it does is, is reinforce and legitimize that lack of emotional connection, which um, in in many ways would simply be rather considered inappropriate, you know, it's that sort of idea. I mean, I think that's really interesting, Simon, and and I want to follow up with a question that we always ask, but I think it's particularly opposite for this conversation and in the light of the comments that you've just made. Why does this idea that you have matter so much right now? Well, um, I think you've already mentioned there's quite a lot of attention being being focused on on this topic, and I think it goes. I mean, it goes back to one very stark uh, fact, David, and that is that the boarding school population, uh, in terms of global pupils, represents less than one percent of the school school population. It is a very very small group of people, and yet they influence quite disproportionate 
uh, involvement in, in, in society's leading positions. And of course, we've had two prime ministers recently drawn from Eton, Cameron and um, now Johnson. What I've done, which is which I think is is my is one of my innovations, is that there's, there's been for quite a long time a critique of the overrepresentation of what's called private education in 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 the institutions and and, and power structures of of the UK, but it's always included day schools as well, and it's called the seven percent problem. And uh, in actual fact, the really serious problem, in my view. It's not the 7% problem, which has its own uh, implications. It's the less than 1% problem. Um, and I was the first person to disaggregate the figures uh, and say, look, you've got, to, you've got to treat these separately. And I did a little exercise for the um, Private Education Policy Forum earlier in the year, uh, in which I thought, OK, I'm going to look at Johnson's cabinet from this perspective. and. Um, I came up with some, they didn't surprise me very much, but they certainly surprised the Private Education Policy Forum. And it turns out that in Johnson's cabinet, which is about 30, it depends a bit who's in and who's out, 37% of the cabinet compared with 0.7% of the UK pupils um, were from boarding schools. And three were from Eton. And in a way that just sort of graphically illustrated the disproportion. Um, so we have, we have really to ask the question, what, 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 what is the effect of having so many leading positions in our society, not just in politics, but business, in the media, in the judiciary? You know, what is the effect of drawing these people from such a narrow spectrum of society in a culture which we know, in actual fact, is um, emotionally inhibited? And to put it in more sort of human terms, you know, finds it very difficult to, um, to, to show empathy. And in my father's case, even to shake my hand, you know. So, um, you know, there's lots of sort of anecdotal evidence as well. Simon, we're going to come back in just a moment to get a little insight into the personal experience that you have of this, uh, which I think will be really helpful to our listeners. But can you take a moment to just really articulate where you were going there? Why do you think it's important that we all think about this? Most people actually do have a kind of inbuilt sense of needing warmth, affection, particularly from people who are close to them and, and particularly within, within the family. So I think, I think all of us do carry, unless you've been brought up in an upper class context, I mean, this, this is the kind of, you know, conundrum in a way, um, where it's not valued. So, so I think that, most people would say, yes, you know, um, we, we need a certain degree of warmth and understanding to, to, to function as, as kind of um, uh, fully rounded human beings. And if one, if one wants to extend that, which I would do to society, in, in a society which cares for the more vulnerable and, 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 the, and the less able, you know, so it, there, there is a kind of value judgment at the back of that somewhere, but I, I would say it's rooted in and feelings of warmth and closeness and, and mutual support. I'm absolutely fascinated, Simon, because one of the things which I think you do is you open up the whole debate about choice and impact in terms of boarding education. So people would defend the right to send their children to boarding school on the basis of freedom of choice. But in fact, what you illustrate beautifully is that when they do that, they make a choice for everyone because the consequences then is to create, if you like, a tribal sect, which then significantly governs this country. And the point that you make about empathy, I think is hugely important. Um, Johnson's comments, that's Boris Johnson in case anyone's confused. Um, Johnson's comments this week about Thatcher getting us off to an early start on addressing climate change by closing down the pits was such a stark illustration of a man completely at sea with the idea of common understanding. And I think the idea that you're opening up that without common understanding, we can't have commonality. And without commonality, we don't have society. We simply have what I think we're seeing through the Good Law Project, a governing class 
exploiting society for their own enrichment and the enhancement of their power. Is that a reasonable step to take from your work? Yeah, I would just say something on the freedom of choice angle, David, as well, because it's a, it's a remarkably abstract concept. If you can only uh, exercise it, if, if you can spend 30 or 40,000 pounds a year on sending your child to, to, to school, you know, so it's, I don't even think it's freedom of choice. I think, well, I think we have to knock that argument very firmly on the head as well, myself. You know, it's a bogus argument um, in itself. And then it has, uh, I think, the kind of potential malign effect which, which, you, which you just described. But you're right. Simon, maybe here's a good time to just ask you to share a bit of your personal experience, because many of our listeners will have no experience of boarding school, especially early boarding school, and have to imagine the kind of emotional limitations or compressions that your, that your work is grounded in. Well, it's difficult because um, statistically speaking, 99% of the listeners to this program will not have been to boarding school. So, um, and in Scotland, that proportion is even worse. It's more like, you know, less than half a percent. Or better. Or, or better, yes, 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 99.5%. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think it's, it, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to explain. I'm, I'm going to approach it slightly tangentially. Because I've had to reconstruct this re retrospectively, Suzanne. You know, it's something that, that happened to me, and it was a kind of it was it was expected. You know, I, I was on this conveyor belt um, from nannies, you know, to au pairs, to to prep, to, to uh, weekly boarding, and and then and to full boarding at a, at a prep school. I was still seven, you know, uh, and. I even have a horrible, there's a certain amount of evidence I even asked to go a term early, you know, so it's it's kind of like, um, it, you know, I am constructing something partly in retrospect, you know, after after trying to get to grips with, you know, lots of sort of um, inner problems I have and kind of queries and sort of mysteries about my own, my own personal uh, development, you know. But let me just give you a little anecdote, which I think sort of, might bring it home to the 99 or 99.5%. Um, I, I, I actually sort of um, mar married somebody who, who'd already been married and had children from a previous relationship. And um, quite early on in that relationship, her, her daughter had, had, had a, a son. So I, I became a, a stepfather and a step-grandfather. Um, and also around this time, unfortunately, my wife developed cancer, so she wasn't very well. Um, and this this young this young child came along, um, the, the father of which had disappeared, you know. So it was very much fell to us to try and sort of pick this up. So I got to know this boy, little boy, very well. And I think most of my emotional education came from being in such close contact with this growing infant initially I resented enormously and I was trying to deal with my wife's illness and then I was having to deal, deal with this little boy and about, about three weeks later I was you know I, I fell in love with him in a, in a way which I couldn't possibly explain <laughs> so I, I kind of developed this very very close uh, relationship and, and you know kids of that age they, they're not going to stop crawling all over you you know I, I had to confront certain limitations of my own background and myself um, and uh, it was kind of like, you know, do I, do I sort of um, disappear into the stiff upper lip? Or do I, in actual fact, sort of um, respond to this little infant in a way which is <laughs> he wants and is appropriate? And, and in some ways, I was a joint. So, look, to, to fast forward a little bit, um, and he got to the age of six or seven, um, and I was kind of, um, I mean, I had a very close relationship with him. I could, I could see what his needs were. You know, he'd come and stay at least once or twice a week. Uh, I would get up in the night to look after him because my wife often wasn't well enough, you know. Um, and I, I suddenly realised, gosh, that was the age I was sent off to boarding school. Can I imagine it put me in touch with how, I suppose, my state of vulnerability, I mean, just my state of dependence, you know, 
and and the sort of idea of a sending this little boy away uh, was was unbearable. But then there was also a reflection for myself: was I? That's that's what I must have been like at that age, you know. Really, um, I, I needed looking after. I needed I needed close contact. Um, I needed an uh, you know a sympathetic ear. Um, I needed somebody to take me around the garden and point out the plants. You know, it was it was a kind of um, uh, uh, sort of real real eye opener for me, Suzanne. You know, um, so I'm I'm just I'm using that as an anecdote. I, I think I think most people if they think think themselves back to their their relationships at the age six, seven, eight. Um, they're very closely embedded in their families and very dependent on, on uh, you know, hopefully, I mean, not all families go well. I mean, I'm, let's not be naive, but, you know, um, in, in a reasonable sort of family setting, you know, there's, there's that sort of inbuilt intimacy. It's quite an insight to have. And it's fascinating that it's a child who has taught you that. David? Yeah, I, I was going to say, Simon, that's so much more than an anecdote because it's what it is is an illustration of the healing power of relationships as long as we're open to, to learning from them. Um, and it's interesting. You had one child and learned so much. And the current prime minister with similar background has had a, an apparently indeterminate number of children and failed to learn. So we're, we're talking about something very powerful in terms of that impact that, you know, that one relationship, that one opportunity for awareness you saw and were open to, and it changed you. And the, but it must be so culturally deep for others from your class and background that even that doesn't change their sense of the world. I, th I think that's a very difficult one to to understand. Um, I mean, how it how it gets transmitted intergenerationally. I I, th I look one, one, once entering a total institution for, for ten years, one might come from a background which is, uh, you know, my 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 um my grandfather went to Eton, but you know, um, Alec Drenton, whose name is probably familiar to you. You know, on his mother's side, there were 12 generations of borders. You know, some, some of these things have been, the pattern has been there for a very long time and, and gets transmitted, you know, um, in, a, in a sort of unreflective way. Despite, you know, you, you, you hear stories of people saying, yes, I had a terrible time at boarding school, but I still sent my children there, you know. And, and in, the, in the boarding school survivors movement, you, you have these sort of uh, very, very moving stories about, well, you know, why, why did they send me, you know, if they, they knew how awful it was? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a conundrum. How do families do that? Because I can imagine that there are many people listening this morning who will ask your very question, how could you possibly send a six-year-old away to boarding school? Help, help us to understand what it's like to grow up in a culture where that is simply expected how do you send a six-year-old off to an institution? Against the background of a culture which, which has expelled or, or, or split off um, a lot of very basic human emotional needs. And, um, you know, the, the, unfortunately, the, 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 our cultures of the powerful, um, uh, maybe this is the, you know, partly the link to, to medievalism, monarchy um look, look at the stories about prince charles going to gordonston for instance you know i mean it's it's kind of known it's known and not known and i think one of the frightening things about this this, this class background i come from is its capacity to to um split off um and um it it, it it is very, very, and I think, I think actually people quite often see it. And they're so horrified. I think in actual fact, in the Cummings Kuhnsberg interview, she sees him doing it, but, but she's so kind of um, uh, horrified by it. She can't really, she can't really confront it. It's, it's like when Johnson 
won't ask, answer questions about how many children he's got. It's completely bonkers. But the interviewer can't, can't sit there and say, Mr. Johnson, you're, you're, you, you're completely off the page. You know, what are you on about? So it's 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 a kind of uh, I, I don't know it's a sort of normalized madness at one level, Suzanne, which you, which you will understand with your psych, psych, psychological background. You know, I mean, it is incredibly difficult to to, ex, to, to describe and explain. I mean, I, I think we'll we'll come back to and explore all of this more, Simon, as we go through this conversation. But I, I think one of the things that, that you've observed is that we can see the damage, if you like, and I know you're uneasy with the word damage, but, but if we're loose in, in terms of that, we can see it playing out in front of us through people like Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings, and you've alluded to both of them in that last response. But do you want to, to expand on that, that whole idea of what it is we see playing out through the behaviour of these two men in particular, who were hugely influential in terms of Brexit, one of the most massive decisions that we've taken as a nation, or some of us took as a nation, um, in, in recent times? Look, I, I, I think this is, this is where we, we kind of... Uh, try and look at the, the intersection of power and psychology. And I think it's, I think it's an area which we, um, we still don't have a very good um, grip on myself. And this is, this is in a way a bit by a drawback from the word damage. Because I think that's um, over, if I could put it this way, psychologizing it. Um, because in actual fact, the, the, um, the dynamics of politics, very often it seems to me, are about denial, about um, uh, divide and rule, um, about uh, qualified lying. You know, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's as organised and and organised over over a, a long a long period of time. Um, and again, I think. That, these are some of the, the, the residues of medieval Europe, which still live on, and maybe not just medieval Europe. I mean, I'm, what's coming to my mind at the moment is, is what's going on in Afghanistan, you know. Um, so that I think there are some very uh, primitive damaging mechanisms in the world of politics. And then they intersect with um, individual psychology. And, and if you've got a class group, which has a sort of monopoly on, on, on access to power, it, it then sort of um, interacts in a malign way with, with individual psychology. Um, I, I, I don't pretend I have, I have a sort of complete grasp of what's going on there, right? but I'm pretty sure that's the sort of field, field we're in. And is it the kind of political dynamics which is corrupting um, individual psychology? Is it sort of um, extreme versions of the individual psychology which is which is corrupting politics? But it, it's, it's a bit of both, I think. And um, to go back to, to, to Alex Renton, because I've been reading his book, Blood Legacy, and one which is a, a, a very brave and um, appalling account of his family's involvement and um, actually, in actual fact, lots of the Scots nobility involvement in, in slavery in the West Indies. And I think one of the things that has struck me is that um, the dynamics of the situation pushed quite um, enlightened Scotsmen to at least sanction, if not directly involved, in the most appalling treatment of fellow human beings. Now, it seems to me there are certain circumstances in which there is a very malign interaction between the dynamic of power and politics and individual psychology. And we need to look at that a lot more carefully. And what you're doing wonderfully around that, Simon, if, if I may, it is you, you're providing the questions. You know, whether or not you provide answers, I think is largely irrelevant. But there's something <clears throat> underpinning all of that, which just fascinates me, and it's how this medieval elite, if you like, 
um, that, that, that has existed has suddenly been able to reassert itself in this country. You know, in, in defiance of all sorts of theories of political development, we suddenly probably have the most aristocratic, the most boarding school educated cabinet and government that we've had for decades. And it feels from the standpoint of somebody like me as a step backwards. Um, and we seem to have made that step backwards almost uniquely in this country. Can you pose us any questions around that that would be useful to enhance our understanding? I mean, I, th I think we, we um, possibly see the interaction of, of two things. Um, one is um, kind of reaction to um, sort of globalised neoliberalism which certainly weakened um, the notion of the, uh, here is again another interesting word, sovereign nation state. Uh, sovereignty itself is a medieval concept, by the way, not a particularly democratic concept. Um, um, and then a sort of um, pushback against that to some extent by people who, who'd, who'd been left left behind or hadn't, hadn't benefited from the dynamics of, of global capitalism. And I think a sort of one of the responses to that was a sort of fairly reactionary nationalism. Um, it wasn't an attempt to synthesize something, a new form of more democratic politics. It seemed a kind of rather aggressive move. And I think one also has to, um, this is where you know I put the word damage in inverted commas. Well, one has to recognise that the British um, political elite is is very experienced in in manipulation and moving and being flexible. You know, this is where, in a way, the immigration card was played. Three hundred and fifty million on the side of the bus. The, the nasty Europeans are stealing all our money. The Turks are about to invade. Unfortunately, there, were, there was a kind of a, a modicum truth, truth in that, in that New Labour, in actual fact, sort of um, an alliance with, with, with global capitalism, had relaxed border controls here in a way which they didn't have to do without thinking through the consequences for ordinary people. It's another, it's another issue, I think, David, where, you know, Mr. Blair, product of Fetty's school, um, again, was also... But, and, and the London elite were also quite cut off from ordinary people's concerns and interests, you know. And there was a section of the Tory party that played on that. I think Johnson is just an opportunist. We know he wrote two different editorials, you know, the day before the um, referendum result. Um, so he, his, his own psychology is, is quite a dangerous factor in this situation. So, Simon, I, I think... One of the things that's fascinating about your work is that you take really big themes. You just identified a lot of big themes, Brexit, racism, xenophobia, immigration, politics. Those feel like big themes to lots of people. But you then bring it right down to a very personal level. And you are saying that the capacity of our political leaders to attune to our needs, to a society's needs, to our needs as individuals, to have enough food, to have community members that we relate to, to have lives that feel safe and fulfilling and, and community context that support that. You are saying that their capacity to help society do that is impaired by their experiences as children of the safety of other people. You bring it right down to childhood experiences. Have I got that right? Uh, have I got it that right? Uh, I, I, look, I've, in a way, I've, I've had to try and find my own way out of this very um, confusing situation. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was born into and, and, and brought up in, and which actually has quite a complicated colonial connection um, through the French side of my family. I've, I've had to um, 
you know, I'm now 74, so it's taken me quite a while, um, uh, to, to try and find some way out of this, uh, out of this maze, you know. Uh, it, that sounded almost too good to be true, Suzanne. Well, but Simon, I don't think it's too good to be true. I think what's important about your work and about the work of so many authors who are now reflecting on their boarding school experiences and trying to communicate them to readers. And there are a number of those books coming out. You've mentioned Alex Renton as one author. I think what they are trying to say is that your childhood experiences shape you in fundamental ways. And then when you become a political leader with power, you have the potential to damage other people's lives because you don't have the emotional capacity to relate to those lives. And the reason that I'm pushing that here is because I think many people are confused and outraged by Johnson's behavior or Cummings' behavior or other political leaders' behavior, and you don't understand it. Your work helps us to understand it because not only is it manipulative, if you don't have the emotional capacity to understand other people's needs, then suddenly some of those cruel decisions make more sense. I, I suppose it does make more sense. I suppose what's, what's worrying Suzanne is um, the disconnect between um, a certain level of awareness, which I think is probably quite widespread now, um, and a seeming incapacity to, to stop the process. Um, and I think, you know, um, if this, I mean, I don't think, our, I don't think the sort of conversation we're having this morning could go out on the BBC, for instance. I mean, I was thinking there's, the, there's a, there's a the trouble is the sort of attitudes we're, we're, we're describing um, aren't just the um, uh, uh, province of ex, ex boarding schools. They've seeped into all sorts of areas of our society. Uh, it's very, I think, implicated in a certain sort of BBC approach. Um, I was even thinking of the way we organise debates in Parliament which really are a kind of reflection of a sort of dating uh, society in a public school. There's a whole sort of very a series of very kind of subtle filters, which sort of either shunt the outrage to one side or, or, or suddenly kind of damp it down with politeness. Um, but the other thing is, look, this, this is a group of people who, they're they're brought up to exercise power. You know, they 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 have a they have a different. Look, I think we're talking about a much um, more caring form of power. You know, which is more 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 uh, more more of a conversation, more something we negotiate with each other. In actual fact, a kind of uh, a sophisticated form of democracy. Whereas we still live in a in a in a culture which has this. Uh, you know. The word leader, for instance, we don't, we don't, we, 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 we sometimes think we, we, we could have better leaders, but we actually need to examine the whole notion of leadership. You know, it, it, so it, 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 it goes very deep and very wide. And this is why this conversation is so interesting, because we're, we're actually sort of uh, unpicking some of these assumptions, you know, and saying, look, we've got, we've got, to, we've got to look at this more closely. And I, just to go back to your original point about why these things are, are maybe the although there have been actually quite a few sort of um, boarding school memoirs over the last 10 years. Um, I, mean, I, do, I, I do think that some of the contradictions are becoming so blatant. And it's quite interesting, you know, Louis de Bernier, for instance, you know, people, people need to get into their 60s. I was in my late 50s before I really got hold of some of this. You know, it is so, um, it, it's been so embedded. And then you've got parents who might disappoint but there are all sorts of family relationships you're going to have to part company with. You know, it's it's a very difficult thing to um, actually broach, both personally and 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 socially. But I think um, I think the veneer is wearing thin, you know, um, and 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 more people and systems collapse not only from the outside; they collapse internally. You know, when people stop believing in it. I think, yeah, I think I think there are more upper class people actually sort of saying, yeah, what on earth happened to me? You know, that wasn't good. Um, I don't want to send my kids to 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 boarding school. 
Um, so, so something's something quite interesting is, is going on there. I think the danger is if we kind of then think, oh, if we reform boarding schools, all the problems will go away. So I actually think the problems are broader and deeper than that, you know, and, and we have to kind of recapture some notion of, 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 a, of a cooperative social democracy, um, which, which we've never actually fully um, developed in this country. I mean, you're actually giving us hope in that in that frame, David. Simon, this is stunning because um, one of the things that Suzanne and I did recently was engage with a film um, called Warriors, The Boys of Ballycan Rain. And what that does it, is it describes the experience of three young men who all went to a school, a, a residential school, uh, dealing with young people, social, emotional, behaviour difficult. And one of the, the boys in that film is you. Um, he's, he's absolutely an allegory for you. He's been able to engage with a whole emotional palette beyond the one that he grew up in. He's no longer a prisoner of his past. And the other two boys are still captured in it. The only power they can exercise is through violence, um, through aggression, uh, through controlling the, lim the limited and immediate situations in which they can exercise power through intimidation. And, and they are viewed in a totally different way from their parallels. And, and you describe this beautifully. We, we, you know, we, we, they're described differently from their parallels within the current government. Um, you, you've done something wonderfully well this morning which is to identify the elision between feudalism in terms of that kind of established aristocratic elite and greed. So we've got this coming together of aspiration, avarice and entitlement. And what I think you're doing is showing how all of that is currently fueled by populism. And it's allowed that group to come out against what they would describe as the liberal elite. So there's so much I think you've done this morning, but that particular idea of aces for one group, the boys of Balik and Rain, are viewed in a particular way, arguably strongly by Pretty Patel as Home Secretary. And the aces of another group, Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings and others, are viewed in a totally different way. Um, David, David, that's really fascinating because to suggest that boarding school is an ace is really stunning for a lot of people. They will not have thought about it. And yet, if you understand that adverse childhood experiences, that is aces, is talking about meeting the emotional needs of children and the trauma that comes from that, if those needs are not met, you're spot on, David and Simon. The boarding school becomes an ace, and therefore our, our political leaders are emotionally damaged people. Now, for some people, that'll, they'll just be listening to this and going, duh, that's obvious. But for other people, describing them that way will feel like a surprise. David, does that make sense to you that boarding school is an ace? Well, I, I mean, I, I think what we're talking about is we're, we're, we're talking about the relationship between parents and children. Um, you know, the, I, I, again, one of the parallels for this discussion would be the Patrick Melrose series of novels. Um, and Patrick Melrose, in, in that novel, they, they don't talk about his experience of boarding school, but they talk of his experience of parenting, which parallels, if you like, the, the, it, it, it's, the, it's the belief in sending away, it's the willingness to send away, it's the estrangement, it's that lack of relationship, which is crystallised around the boarding system. But your point, Simon, which is so important, is that it starts before the school and continues beyond it. Well, uh, yes, in a way that, yeah, I mean, it, it, it sort of, um, it, it becomes self-evident, David, I think, once you, once you uh, strip away the sort of um, privileged veneer, you know. I mean, the difference between, you know, being sent into local authority residential care 
and, and boarding school at one level is simply that um, in a local authority setting, you're removed for your, for your supposed um, good. Uh, in a boarding school, your parents voluntarily send you to prison. You know, I mean, it's kind of, it's a, it's a strange paradox. But, but also, you know, the, uh, in a way, one can also see the displaced um, compensation in terms of, you know, the three boys you were talking about, the, the two who are still trapped in their rage. If you've been denied that birthright, which is to have a, an, a warm, emotional welcome to this world, you see. I mean, I, th I think there's, um, and then I think this is, there can be an awful sort of uh, unholy alliance between less well-resourced people in our society who also suffer from those lacks in some, in some awful way identifying with people at the upper echelon, echelons of society also strangely have similar emotional lacks. You know, there's some very strange sort of alliances going on here. Some of the psychodynamics are very similar. At one level, we are all very similar. We all have rather similar needs, you know. And it's it's the kind of political divisions which often hide this in a way. Social divisions. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a wonderful line in, in Jimmy McGovern's uh, TV series, Time, where the, the, the guy who controls the prison in which the series is set says, look at me, I'm not exactly Goliath but I'm prepared to do the things that other people won't do. And it's that carapace of fearlessness and that carapace that is created by a lack of sense of consequence, which enables that kind of engagement and activity. Well, I th I th you see, I think, David, that's where um, uh, power becomes such a, you know, um, potentially destructive force if, if, it, if it's untrammeled, can't be questioned, can't be contained. Um, because it, it can it can feed into these sort of um, well sort of quasi-psychotic aspects of of, 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 of of human nature, you know. Um, if if you haven't succeeded in in in, in, in integrating some of these very early experiences. In rage is a common factor. I mean, it's, it's disguised rage in some ways. Um, and then you start destroying other people, you start destroying other things, you become, you become reckless. And one of the things that, that came through in, 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 in the Cummings interview with Kuhnsberg was, you know, the sort of um, the cavalier attitudes. Uh, we'll, we'll have a little experiment in Brexit. Without, and he, he actually said, I don't know whether it's a good idea or not. I thought, my God, you know. He set off on this journey as a sort of kind of um, intellectual game without thinking through any of the consequences. I mean, and, and Cameron sort of put up this half-baked referendum, you know, with no threshold in it. I mean, you know, it, it's just um, there's a kind of uh, lack of thought, a, a, a lack of um, consequential uh, thinking, which, which runs through the system at a certain level. And, and you're absolutely right, David. It's potentially extremely dangerous. Um, and I, I mean, I do, I do see some signs that people are now, you know, sort of waking up, and thinking, you know, God, we've got the uh, these people are, are in charge of the system or not in charge. Um, I mean, that was the other thing that was terrifying about the Cummings interview, was was just showing, you know, that actually, uh, the, 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 it's, it's chaotic. It is actually right at the centre. It's chaotic, you know. A lot of our conversation today has been about men and drawing on the energy of masculinity. Where does femininity fit into your thinking? I know that's a simplistic division and even an outdated one, given the fractious societal conversations that we're having about gender identity, but let's try it anyway. Where does femininity fit in your thoughts? I see a whole critique, in a sense, as a way of of remothering, of of retrieving the maternal from its denigration. Um, 
I mean, in some ways, the institution of certainly of Victorian boarding schools, boarding schools more generally, or even to go back to the medieval ideal of the knight, you know, um, it, it is a, it's, it's a very masculine world. And I think we have to say that the world of politics is still, despite some advances by women, a very, a very masculine world. So my, my, my own mindset, if you like, is a constant dialogue in a way with the need to, to, to find a, a, a more, uh, how can I put this as a man? It's difficult. A sort of a, a more, okay, a more feeling approach has to be in the present context, um, a more feminine motherly approach. You know, I mean, why are we ruining the planet? Sometimes, you know, recognized as mother earth. There was an awful kind of, uh, of the public schools in, in, in the mid 19th century called Woodward, who quite explicitly said the idea was to take the boy from the, um, the maternal influence of home. You know, it, was, it was an explicit project, in a way, to, to uh, hyper masculinize men, in a sense. And I belong to this men's group, which, which goes back 30 years. I'm a, I'm a newcomer, you know. I mean, there, 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 is, there is a strand in men's work as well, which has taken the feminine. Very seriously, I, mean, I see myself in that in that that tradition. Uh, I don't know how successfully, but that's that's where I where I place myself. We're going to ask one last thing of you, which is just to give us any ideas that you have about what you would like the teachers, which is the biggest number of people in this audience, whether they're in state schools, private schools, or boarding schools. How might they put your insights into practice? I think we have to take some of these ideas. I mean, we've been critiquing a certain form of education or pedagogy because of its uh, malign influence on wider political and social structures. I think we do need to take this into a much more political sphere, personally, that, that we, we actually now have, we have to seriously reform our pedagogy. And I don't just mean in private boarding schools. I think quite often some of the people who criticise uh, private boarding schools just, just assume the state system's OK. If we got rid of public schools, it would be, it'd be all right. I think there are, are very serious flaws in what we call education, which I think in, in many ways is indoctrination and propaganda. The point that you make is huge, and, and we we've become conditioned to think of people as victims of poverty, but we don't think on people like Therese Morgan and others as victims of wealth. Um, and then the consequence of that, that we, 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 then, we then become the victims. Um, it, but I, you know, you could have been much Yeah, I, 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 think, I think there's something um, which uh, only quite recently I think I've I'm more aware of uh, David, and that is kind of um, uh, sort of. If you're not very careful, one's one's quite justifiable inner rage um, sets off more rage. You know, it, it's 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 a it's a kind of it's an energy, but in actual fact, it, it, you know, to, it, to 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 use it in a controlled way is 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 uh, is is also necessary. You know, all we get at the moment is polarity. Um, we, we, don't, we don't get debate at all. Um, and it's fascinating because Johnson won't engage in debate. Um, well, again, I think the BBC doesn't know how to do that. I mean, I, 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 I you know, you see, I, I think this is where, I mean, Suzanne heard me say this before, but um, Winnie Cott's idea, the, the, the unorthodox psychoanalyst, a pediatrician actually as well, who have um, probably seen more, 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 it, uh, mother infant couples and, and, and anybody else. Um, he worked for 40 years at the Pennington Green Children's Hospital. Uh, and he, he came up with this idea which I find incredibly useful, and that is that it's the space between mother and the infant where the world is explored, where the infant finds out, where mum begins, where he ends, where where our curiosity is, is kind of... Um, a natural curiosity, um, which, which again I, I experienced with my with my step uh, grandson. You know, um, what what's that? So I'm you're know, going around the garden, the bee. You know, all the and and in actual fact, um, and, and and 
Winnicott considered this, this space, he called the transitional space, as the foundation for a kind of uh, culture and, and everything that is really kind of potentially good in our society. Um, and it would include religion and that, science, education. And um, there, there are very few places, and this is clearly one of them, where, where, that, where that transitional space can open up. But it's, it's something, in actual fact, if we've been lucky um, or we've found a way of recreating it, we all do have some notion of the, that early um, playful. He, he considered psychotherapy to be the highest form of play. Um, you know, which which I think is a, you know, so there's a, there's a kind of um, yeah, serious playfulness. It's interesting because, you know, lots of the kind of Langian existential psychology, it's about that idea of taking people right back to that very earliest experience and kind of rebuilding again. And, and you know, so much of that stuff, simply for, for a whole variety of reasons, didn't work, became discredited. Um and rather than say, well, where are the strengths? What is there in this approach that we can build on? Um, you know, it, it's it's just interesting to look at how that culture of dismissiveness has become inbuilt. That as soon as something has found to be flawed, it's stop it, move on. Uh, rather than that, it, you know, the idea of intellectual eclecticism of of picking up different ideas, building on them, shaping them in different ways. I think it's, it's really interesting how we've moved away from that. Um, yeah, well, I think a lot of a lot of kind of you see kind of a sort of conventional media interviewing techniques are terribly sort of confrontational and destructive, and they bring out the worst in people. You know, people get defensive; they feel under attack. Um, and, and the, the, there's a very there's a very malign aspect I think of contemporary media. I'm not just talking about social media. Um, and uh, I, I don't quite know. Again, it's partly some mis, mis, misguided notion of competition for audiences. I mean, well, the thing we haven't really talked about very much today is, is the sort of capitalist dynamics which are playing in the background. But, but you know, they're, they're they're part of the problem in their extreme form as well. We, we, we need more spaces like this in which we can connect and explore. Simon, you have taken us on quite a journey and we are so grateful that you have been with us today. Only, only to say thanks, Simon. That uh, for me has just been such a brilliant and insightful conversation. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. Lovely. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Our guest today has been Simon Partridge, researcher and writer. He's actively involved in the boarding school survivors movement, including leading a campaign to end early boarding. He's also one of the founders of the London ACES Hub, which traces some of their impetus to the energy of the Scottish ACES movement. Simon has recently co-authored a special issue on ACES and attachment theory with me, which was published in June, 2021, in the journal Attachment, published by the Bowlby Center. And he's now turned his writing attention to what he terms British upper-class complex trauma. And we know that he's keen to share with others his thinking on cultural characteristics, such as entitlement, discriminatory behavior, and the stiff upper lip. His insights are edgy and uncomfortable, which is exactly why we wanted to have him join us here on the Ideas Hour. And we also thank you, the listeners, for joining us. And we look forward to hearing any of your thoughts and feedback on today's edgy discussions. This has been the Ideas Hour, brought to you by Suzanne Zedike and the real David Cameron.